Right, good afternoon everyone and welcome back. We do appreciate you joining us for our fourth session in this initial bite-sized corrosion series. Today, we will be looking at impressed current cathodic protection or ICCP in some more detail. Now, if the acronym ICCP has you feeling bewildered, let me take a couple of minutes to quickly recap how we got here. The aim of this series of bite-sized corrosion conversations was really to take corrosion and cathodic protection and break the subject down into its basic building blocks in an endeavor to help make it less confusing and more understandable, particularly to the non-corrosion engineers amongst us. Now, ensuring that any structure is protected from corrosion is the intention of the majority of design engineers but many feel they have no knowledge and are not even sure what the right questions to ask really are. And that's what we are aiming to help with. So in our first talk, we looked at the basic mechanism of corrosion. The fact that on a buried structure, we have a metal pathway through the structure, an electrolyte in the soil, and that some areas of the structure become anodic and corrode whilst other areas remain cathodic and do not corrode. Now we really want the non-corroding version represented across our entire structure. And so we use the process of cathodic protection to change all our anodic regions into cathodic regions. And this isn't done by magic. We do this by creating a corrosion cell where our structure is made into the cathode of the cell and we select something else to be the anode. Now, last week, we focused on sacrificial anode cathodic protection, or SACP, where we choose a more active material to corrode preferentially. We looked at suitable materials like magnesium, zinc, and aluminium, and we discussed briefly how they work and where we can use them. We saw that the driving force between the two materials determines their usefulness. And we also saw that the type of coating and the soil conditions determine how much current we require. Obviously, calculations will determine whether we can get enough material to give us the desired current for the design life. And we briefly mentioned that some of the drawbacks to using sacrificial anodes are the fact that they self-corrode and that sometimes they passivate and stop working. And we need to consider these factors in the design. On a practical level, we noted that aluminium is used in offshore structures like jetties and offshore platforms. Zinc is commonly used on a ship's hull. And on land, we find magnesium being used in low resistance soils and even zinc being used in low current requiring situations. Now pop on over to our YouTube channel to watch the videos and get a fuller picture. Today, Neil's going to be looking at what happens when we need a greater driving force than sacrificial anodes can provide using an external power supply in an impressed current cathodic protection system or ICCP system. It's over to you, Neil. So the title of today's presentation is ICCP, Can We Still Use It? Melissa has already expounded on what ICCP means, so I don't need to tell you again. And the question, can we still use it? Well, we looked at sacrificial anodes last week, and we saw that they have a great many uses. And some people might think, well, why don't we use sacrificial anodes all the time? So impressed current cathodic protection has a particular um, advantage in that it can be used to protect long lengths of pipe. So if we have a look at this diagram, it indicates in a kind of a, a three-dimensional map that we have a long pipeline over here. It is connected to the negative output of a rectifier and the positive output from that rectifier goes off some distance to an anode that is placed in the ground. And the elevations on this drawing represent the actual voltages. So the anode is positive, quite highly positive with respect to the ground, and the pipeline is negative. The pipeline negative is, 
the minus 0.85 volts. The anode positive could be anything like 20 or even 30 volts in order to drive the current that is needed. The bottom line of this is that we can protect very long lengths of pipeline from corrosion using this form of cathodic protection. When we look at an actual installation, there is the pipeline. We're standing over the top of the pipeline. There's the rectifier housed in a what appears to be a secure concrete enclosure, an incoming power supply from the local utility, and everything looks great. So then you may well say, well, why do we ask the question, can we still use it? Unfortunately, in South Africa in particular, we have a major problem with vandalism and theft and the destruction of infrastructure that is in remote areas, as is evidenced by these photographs and these what appeared to be secure concrete enclosures can be broken open by people who have got lots of time and lots of innovation on their hands. Is that the right question? Should we be asking the question, can we still use it? Well, actually, we've had, we have had some very disturbing questions from infrastructure owners who have said, well, we need to put in a pipeline. Uh, we would prefer to put in a steel pipeline, but the cathodic protection is such an issue due to the theft and vandalism of infrastructure that we have to look at alternative materials. And that is a real challenge because for high pressures, there are no real alternatives to steel pipelines, particularly in the larger sizes. We need to remember that impressed current cathodic protection, though, is not just for pipelines. So let's have a look at where else we can use it. And at the end, we will come back to pipelines and enumerate them further. We've seen that impressed current cathodic protection has a variety of anode materials that are available. These ones that are illustrated here are different forms of activated titanium, where the titanium is coated with a thin layer of mixed metal oxides, which actually allow the titanium to discharge current, whereas it would otherwise just passivate. And so we have mesh anodes that are used in reinforced concrete. We have ribbon anodes, which can be used in reinforced concrete and other things. We have uh, bar anodes. We have wire anodes that can be encased in a cylinder of coke breeze inside a sock in order to improve the contact with the soil. And so this allows us to use impressed current cathodic protection in a wide variety of installations. Here we have a picture of a, a high current output stick anode, which is often used in deep well anode systems. So the first alternative structure that we're going to look at is buried tanks. We really don't want our tanks to land up looking like this, where surgery is the only answer to the corrosion problem. And so it is often practical to use impressed current cathodic protection to protect these tanks against corrosion. I'm sure many of you have on many an occasion pulled up at a filling station. And believe it or not, there are many filling stations around the country, both in South Africa and around the world, where the tanks that hold the fuel are provided with impressed current cathodic protection systems in order to ensure that the fuel tanks do not corrode and cause uh, environmental contamination, never mind any other problems. Some of the two tanks are what we call mounded gas bullets. And you may say, well, what does mounding mean? Well, mounding is very straightforward. It means we bury it above ground. Here's a photograph of a large installation of LPG bullets, storage bullets, which are actually built above ground level and are then covered with soil in order to provide physical protection to the bullets. And using the wire anodes from the, um, the suite of titanium anodes that we have, we can create what is sometimes called a near field impressed current cathodic protection system, also known as a distributed anode system, where we create a positive field around the tanks in order to maintain the tanks negative and thereby prevent corrosion. Above ground storage tanks are also provided with cathodic protection. How on earth do you protect something that's in the air? Well, actually, what we're interested in 
is protecting the bases of these tanks. So most fuel production facilities will have above ground tanks, such as these tanks that you can see over here. Often these tanks are provided with cathodic protection before they are installed, but frequently this process only happens after installation and we're faced with a retrofit situation. In order to retrofit anodes, we have to bury them. And the only practical way to bury anodes in a process environment is to drill holes. And here you can see an illustration of vertical anodes that have been placed around the tank at some depth. And they are connected to a ring main, which is connected to the rectifier, and that in turn connected to the tank. So we have positive anodes and negative to the tank. In order for this system to work effectively, it is preferable to drill these holes at an angle in underneath the tank in order to get the current supplied evenly to the base of the tank, as opposed to putting them outside the perimeter of the tank, which can create quite significant gradients across the tank base. Here you can see a photograph taken down a hole of one of these stick anodes, which has been buried some distance below ground. But what about new tanks, which I mentioned earlier? Environmental controls require that these tanks are provided with secondary containments so that in the event of a leak, the product does not get into the environment. And here around this base, you can see the plastic membrane that has been installed beneath the tank base. We all know the plastic doesn't conduct electricity. So how on earth do we get cathodic protection onto the base of the tank? The answer is to put it between the membrane and the base of the tank. Here you can see a tank base in preparation. It has a membrane that has already been laid. And here you can see the wire anodes that are being laid out on the surface of the membrane. These wire anodes are carefully calculated to ensure that we get coverage of the entire tank. The anodes are then covered in sand. The sand base is built up and eventually you're able to lay the floor plates on top of the sand base. The anodes are then inside the sand and provide cathodic protection to the underside of the tank base. Although not very common in South Africa, we do have elevated water tanks or water towers. These are particularly common overseas. Those of you who live in Johannesburg may recognize this photograph taken of the, what we nicknamed the onion tower that is sitting on the crest of the hill south of Johannesburg. It is a steel water tower and the inside of that water tower is protected using impressed current anodes that are suspended inside the tank in order to protect the inside surface from corrosion. We don't want rusty water coming out through our taps. Vanessa mentioned earlier that zinc anodes are commonly used on ships. Not all ships have sacrificial anode cathodic protection. Here you can see impressed current system that is applied on this particular vessel. That there is an anode which is located close to the stern of the ship in the area of high turbulence. So the principle of distributing the anodes in the areas of highest corrosion is the same as with sacrificial anodes. But instead of using a bunch of zinc anodes, which have to be replaced every couple of years, you can install an impressed current system where the anode will last for many years, maybe 10, 15, even 20 years. In this photograph, you may say, well, what on earth kind of anode is that? If you look carefully, you'll see that these are rods of either titanium or niobium, which have been coated with platinum or with a mixed metal oxide coating in order to discharge the current into the seawater. A common use for impressed current systems overseas is the protection of reinforced concrete. I'm sure most of you have seen the situation where reinforced concrete cracks and spalls. What is actually happening is that the reinforcing is corroding and the increase in volume of the corrosion product causes the concrete to crack due to the tremendous forces that are developed by this expansive corrosion phenomenon. In order to apply cathodic protection, we have to cover the entire surface with an anode. So firstly, all the stressed or cracked concrete is removed. 
and the system is then rebuilt back to its original profile and is then covered with one of the titanium meshes. And you can see over here a titanium conductor bar, for example, that links two sections of mesh together. And this whole system is then uh, coupled up to a rectifier and the reinforcing is maintained negative with respect to this anode mesh. This has been used extensively to rehabilitate particularly concrete bridges and highways overseas where de-icing salts have caused major corrosion of the reinforcing. And so we come back to pipelines. When we looked at the sacrificial anodes, we saw that the anodes were located quite close to the pipeline. If we do that with impressed current cathodic protection, the resulting potential gradient is quite significant and we land up with a relatively short area that is protected by this anode, if it was an impressed current anode. This can be used to our advantage in what we call distributed anode systems. But if you want to protect a long pipeline stretch, such as is illustrated in this photograph, we need to have the anode some distance away from the pipeline. Now, if you had a 100 kilometer pipeline and you decided you needed two rectifiers to protect it, well then ideally you would locate those at 25 kilometers and 75 kilometers in order to get an even distribution along the pipeline. And we saw what happens when we put these rectifiers out in remote areas. These areas often are dictated by ground conditions. Here we see an absolutely ideal ground bed location in that it is low lying, flooded, always wet, and so we have good contact. Sometimes this can be taken a little bit to the extreme and you land up with a situation where the pipeline and the rectifier, which you can just see over there, becomes somewhat inaccessible during extreme climatic conditions. We had remote systems, but as you can see, these are isolated. They're out in the unfrequented areas and are subject to theft and vandalism. One of the things that we can do is relook at our design processes. And together with the advantage of high insulation value coatings, high performance coatings, we can move our rectifiers into more secure locations. We will be covering pipeline coatings in future discussions. And so here is an example of a rectifier that has been located inside the precinct of a pump station, which obviously is a more secure location. One of the issues though that we have with long distance pipelines in particular is that of stray currents and electrical interference. And we will unpack this particular challenge next week. And we're going to look at what is the effect of stray currents. Because with stray currents, we don't have the freedom to put the rectifiers where we want to put them. You can see that these uh, traction units are very high powered. And the stray currents are set up by these traction units. And so therefore we have to locate our impressed current systems where they will guide, I think is the best word to use, they will guide the stray currents back to their source because it is almost impossible to challenge them. And so we look forward to unpacking pipelines in greater detail over the next couple of weeks. Firstly, in terms of stray currents and secondly, in terms of the plant and equipment that we can use to protect them. Thank you, Neil. Gosh, it's a helpful reminder to see that ICCP still has a place and also isn't solely restricted to pipelines. I think sometimes we become a little bit narrow thought processed in that regard. Now, I do see that we have a question, and it's also one of my personal concerns, about vandalism. The question says, in a case of vandalism, what is the risk of not repairing or replacing the cathodic protection infrastructure? Well, that depends very much on what the corrosion situation is on the pipeline. If you have stray current interference where the lack of cathodic protection results in the pipeline being influenced by the stray currents, you can get very, very rapid corrosion rates. We have seen 
pipelines which have been perforated in less than three months under straight current situations. So when we have straight currents, you cannot afford for your straight current protection systems to not be online. And we have to look at ways of securing that straight current protection. If you have a pipeline in a rural area where there are no stray currents and we're only faced with soil corrosion, the corrosion rate is very much lower. And therefore, something that goes offline is not going to cause or allow immediate corrosion. And so there, a matter of a few weeks is not really going to cause any significant damage to the pipeline. Um, what is the current thinking for offshore floating wind turbine power generators? Would you use SACP or ICCP when you do have, obviously, that power supply on site? Sure, that's an interesting question. <laughs> the, the problem, of course, is that the wind generator is providing power at presumably a fairly high voltage, which is then being fed directly into a grid of some description. Cathodic protection requires lower voltage DC, and therefore you would have to install a rectifier locally on the um, wind platform in order to power the cathodic protection, which can be done, but it's an extra piece of equipment. Given the long life of sacrificial anode systems offshore using aluminium, and provided the foundations or the, of the system are well coated, you can easily get in excess of a 30 years life out of a sacrificial anode system. And it may well be more practical to install sacrificial anodes in the offshore situation. The other question of, or aspect, of course, is that if you're going with impressed current offshore, you have to locate the anode system remote from the actual structure. And that means cables suspended through the sea, which has its own risks. There's another question uh, and comment. Um, I'm surprised at the extent on other structures of ICCP. Do you ever see problems with cathodic disbondment where this hasn't been taken into account in the coating design? Yes, very definitely. There was one particular situation where an impressed current system was used on a water pipeline for internal protection, large diameter water pipelines. And these had been coated with an epoxy system, which was supposed to prevent internal corrosion. The system um, was not particularly compatible with cathodic protection. And when the cathodic protection was energized, it caused massive loss of adhesion of the coating system. The system had in fact been designed for bare steel in spite of the fact that the coating was there because uh, we didn't know whether the coating was compatible with cathodic protection or not. It's very, very necessary to ensure that if you're going to use impressed current or even sacrificial anode cathodic protection, you have to use coatings that are compatible with it because cathodic disbonding starts as soon as you get to cathodic protection potentials where, because we are generating um, high pH conditions. Yeah, sadly, I think that very often the coating design doesn't take cathodic protection into account and can cause unintended consequences, as they like to say. In terms of power supplies, is there any risk to using solar or wind power compared with normal utility power? The risk is solely um, related to theft and vandalism overseas we see extensive use of solar and wind power. And if you can come up with a system where the solar panels are inaccessible, then um, it, it will work very satisfactorily. We have to use backup batteries in, a, in association with solar power, because obviously the sun doesn't shine at night. And so the solar systems have to be combined with backup in the form of batteries in order to work. But particularly with modern coatings, which require very little in the way of current, solar systems are very practical. Excellent, thanks Neil. Well, thank you to everyone for joining us for lunch today. 
Uh, we trust that you found this topic somewhat palatable and we encourage you to join us next week when we dig a little deeper into the challenges presented by stray currents. And we'll see you next week. <laughs>